I live in the center of the world, as you can see. Um, and I live at the bottom of the world uh, in Hubbuck, Tasmania. The reason why I show this slide whenever I present is because our whole perspective on the, on the world is shaped by where we live. And our perspective on nature certainly is influenced by where we live. Tasmania is known as a clean and green place, um, and it very much influences how we look at the world. And to give you further insight into that, um, I live in a country where there's uh, indigenous peoples, so Abrig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, that very much influences what I talk about today, um, and it's a reflection of where I live, and the, and the, the histories and politics of where I live as well. So again, my name is Rob White. I was born in Germany, grew up in Canada, I've spent most of my life in Australia, and I'm a proud Tasmanian. So um, that's my potted history. But the topic today is speaking for and about nature. And the reason why this topic for me is important is in the work that I do on green criminology, and in particular environmental sentencing, or sentencing for environmental offences, uh, there's a whole range of concepts that are constantly put forward. And so among the concepts is the idea that we can treat the environment as a surrogate victim. And to treat the environment as a surrogate victim means that humans act on behalf of the environment, uh, which, is the, which is treated as a victim. And I thought, well, okay, which humans? Who should we have stand in for nature when nature's uh, been victimized? Um, I use the notion of non-human environmental entity to describe um, ecosystems, rivers, mountains, non-human animals and plants. Uh, so if I refer to that in the slides to non-human environmental entities, that's what I mean. Because uh, nature is not monolithic and it's not static, which lends itself to some of the difficulties that, that I want to raise today. The other side of this is that if we want to measure the quantum of harm to the environment, then we have to have a sense of, of what is harm to the environment. So again, it goes to that issue of who can speak about the environment and how do we know what's detrimental or not detrimental. So a quick illustration of that would be um, indigenous peoples for millennium uh, used to burn bush, the bush in Australia. Uh, and superficially, we'd say, oh, that looks detrimental to the environment. But in fact, it's part of the regeneration of the environment. Um, our eucalyptus trees have special oils that are fuel, so they burn really quickly. And that's precisely so that the trees can occasionally burn down and regenerate. So again, the question of harm and the quantum of harm, the nature of harm, is something that we have to address fairly um, closely uh, from the point of view of expertise and, and who can talk about the environment. Um, and then a third reason of interest why the topic is important to me is that if we do ascertain that there's harm to the environment and environmental degradation and, and destruction, then we need to know how, to, how do we repair the harm. So how do we engage in strategies of rehabilitation, reparation, and so on, in regards to the environment. And again, that's not necessarily a, a simple task. So that was part of the, the background behind this exercise. The exercise itself is a mapping exercise. And what I'll be doing is speaking for the first part about those who wish to advocate on behalf of the environment and be um, and the second part, I'll talk about expertise and those who wish to speak about the environment. And what I want to do is just raise a, a series of issues. Uh, as I said, uh, we'll walk through some of these. There'll be need for explanation for some of the, the points I'm making on the slide, uh, and we'll just walk through. But basically, from the point of view of advocates, they're saying that nature's voice is important. We must listen to nature. And if you read the uh, the literature, not simply in green criminology, but in environmental ethics, uh, environmental philosophy, eco-philosophy, and so on, there's a lot of discussions about listening to the voice of nature. And I'm thinking, well, okay, how do you do that? And who, who's listening? And whose voice, who's listening to the voice of nature, should we listen to? <laughs> Particularly if it comes to a, a legal case or a court case. So, nature's voice is important in terms of understanding environmental change and harm, um, and that raises the question of, okay, who can advocate on behalf of the environment? This varies greatly worldwide. 
some, in some jurisdictions, um, the general public and environmental activist groups and so on have no legal standing whatsoever. So they can't actually stand up in a court and, and represent nature as advocates. In other jurisdictions, anybody can come in and say, I'm advocating, I'm standing up on behalf of nature. So it depends very much of, of uh, how legal standing is represented within a particular jurisdiction. Usually, in a, a number of cases, you, there has to be some kind of direct interest. So if somebody's cutting down trees in my back garden, I have a direct interest, therefore I can advocate to, to save my trees. But uh, if I'm not li living in that area, then I may not have a direct interest, therefore further off. Um, so the question of legal standing is important. In some places, you have specific legal standing. So I've done a lot of work with the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, and under acts such as the National Parks and Wildlife Act, um, there's a section relating to indigenous heritage that grants, right in, the, right in the beginning, in the legislation, legal standing for indigenous people. So it's very specific and specified standing uh, granted to indigenous people. In other cases, more recently, we see in New Zealand, we have a, a river that's been given legal personhood. Uh, I think it's the Manganui River. And in the legislation giving the river personhood, there's, again, appointment of river stewards. And the river stewards, in this case, are the local Maori community, but also in conjunction with um, local government officials. So again, it's specified in the legislation as to who can speak on behalf of the river. Um, and that question of legal personhood becomes really important later as well. We can also talk of, if you're going to talk about advocates in speaking for the environment, um, Often, again, if you read the literature, there's sometimes it, there's a somewhat, in some respects, romanticized uh, version of advocacy that says, well, indigenous people have the closest connections to country. And so if you, if you analyze indigenous peoples in Australia, country is essential to their being. Um, but also, we can talk about traditional users of, of land, so the hunters, fishers, and so on, who may have been in areas for millennia. They're not necessarily indigenous, but they're traditional users. Um, and they have close connections. So they, they know the fishing spots and how the fish are running. They know the animals and how the animals are running very, very quickly. Um, and so, so on. Um, and of course, uh, traditional users themselves, if any analysis of folk crime, as it deals with the environment, they'll talk about how there's often informal rules of use. So basically, uh, don't take more than you need. Uh, so it sounds very much like some indigenous uh, prescriptions as well. Another admonition might be um, don't hunt certain animals during their, their uh, gestation seasons and their birthing seasons. Um, so there's informal rules. And these are important because if you can talk about advocates for nature, you can't exclude traditional users. Uh, again, the application of this, uh, you, can, you can think of traditional users here in southwest England. Uh, people have been here for yonks means a long time, um, and how they interact with the land and the waters and so on. Uh, but you can think of places in Africa where you have traditional uses of the lands in South America and Australia and so on. Um, we also have a variety of moral positions in terms of advocacy. So we have those who, uh, say, talking about river rights. Uh, they're conservationists and they're advocating on behalf of rivers, but they do so from the perspective of, of riparian rights, i.e. my rights to that river water. So it's, it's anthropocentric, anthropocentric or human-centered, but basically it's to protect the waters for their own use. So, and then you have preservationists who talk about the intrinsic value of the, of the river and that basically the river itself should be seen from a moral position as something that we shouldn't interfere with or touch. This becomes important later, as, as I'll discuss. Um, and then, of course, we have environmental activists advocating on behalf of specific species, whether it's trees and, and particular forests or whales and so on. So you have different moral positions in terms of advocacy. People are advocating for different reasons. And then, of course, you have different user perspectives. There are many stakeholders. And, and part of the question I'm asking is, who should we see as legitimate as an advocate? And I think that should be an open-ended and discussable question. Because we all use or view 
for the environment in quite different ways. Uh, aesthetics. Uh, in Hobart at the moment, there's discussions about putting a cable car to the top of Mount Wellington. And there's a massive debate. And some of the people involved in that debate say it's a question of aesthetics. It will make it look terrible. Um, we want to look out at the freestanding mountain with the trees and, and the rock formations and all this stuff. So it's an aesthetic, partly an aesthetic judgment. Others uh, have different interests. So you've got user perspectives. The park ranger looks at nature quite differently to other users, such as the hunter or the fish walker or the bushwalker. Um, and of course, ecotourism uh, invites a different perspective on nature. So again, from the point of view of advocacy, how you use the environment will very much influence how you would advocate in relation to the environment. You also have different kinds of identifications. And one of the strong things in the, in the literature on indigenous people and the environment is this idea that there's a one-to-one -one connection. This is really strong in the Australian context, where there's a one-to-one -one identity between I am indigenous and this is my country and we are one. And if you read the literature from New Zealand, you'll see that the Maori will often say, that river and myself are one. I am the river, the river is me. So a one-to-one -one identification. And you think, oh, well, they must be the most suitable advocates. And that's an amazing relationship to nature. Then you, you delve a bit deeper, and then you realize um, that other people have very strong affective connections to nature as well. And that having a strong connection to nature is not necessarily limited to indigenous peoples, but also includes non-indigenous peoples. So a former PhD student of mine did a uh, work on Sea Shepherd um, crew, because they were based in Hobart, uh, interviewed them about their experiences of the whales and all that stuff, and also interviewed forest activists in Tasmania. And uh, people literally changed their whole lives when they got the connection with the whales. People literally changed their whole lives because of their connections to the trees. Um, and one of the people he spoke with uh, referred to talking to the tree and having conversations with the, with the tree. So this is a really close, affective situation. And again, it raised the question, should they be advocates, or, or how do we choose who should advocate on behalf of nature and its interests? But, and here's the but, the first buts. And the first buts are this, the notion of ontological anthropocentrism. Basically, we in this room, aside from the chairs and other things, we're human. Um, we're not a river. We're not a mountain, we're not a cat, we're not an owl, um, we're not a seagull. Um, we are, we, so we cannot be that which we are not. We cannot act like a river, a cat, or a flower. So there's always going to be a limit to, if we're advocating on behalf of nature, a limit to that advocacy, because we can never put ourselves in the shoes of that river, that mountain, the cat, the flower, and so on. So there's, there's immediately an ontological limit to advocacy. Then there's material disconnections that we also have to take into account. And here I'll give just a couple of examples. Um, indigenous people in my country have intrinsic strong connections to the land, but many indigenous people for the last century were taken away from their community, from their land, in the form of the stolen generations. Similar thing happened in Canada, um, where basically whole communities of children were taken from their parents. And if you talk to these people who've been taken, ripped away from their, their parents, their siblings, their culture, their land, then you can see that there's no intrinsic connection. They are disconnected from country. So it adds another layer of complexity to this. Likewise, you can have an indigenous community that's divided within and amongst itself. So there was a case in Hindmarsh Island in South Australia a few years back where a developer wanted to build a bridge from the mainland to this island, um, and the objections came not just from environmentalists, but from in local indigenous women. And they said, that island is a place for our sacred women's business. Some of the people who objected to their perspective was another group of indigenous women who had been raised on missions and raised as Christians. And they said, what are you talking about? We don't know any of this stuff. Um, and so they actually came to loggerheads. Uh, over that issue. So we have differences of opinion even within communities as well. Another example is, um, again, 
as part of a material disconnection is our own systemic disconnection worldwide as we move from the countryside into the cities there's been a, a big disconnect with country living and what it is like to be attached to and part of the land. Um, another series of buts, uh, the question of intrinsic rights. So we want to advocate for nature, we want nature to have its own rights, and this is part of the context of my discussion is the whole debate over the rights of nature. Now, in northern Queensland, the Queensland government at one stage passed what was called the Wild Rivers Legislation. And the Wild Rivers Legislation basically said, let the rivers run free uh, and let them be wild without any human intervention. Right? And they think, oh, great, you know, protecting the environment. Um, but the local indigenous people said, what are you doing? These are our rivers. You're telling us that we can't use the rivers for our own economic benefit. So you're taking control out of our hands, but we've got our identification with this land, our country, our rivers, and you're saying that the rivers are somehow disconnected from us. So it blew up into a fairly major issue, and down the track, the legislation was repealed. But you can see some of the dilemmas, right? So if you're going to talk about the rights of nature and speaking for and advocating for nature, um, that's one of the immediate paradoxes or contradictions. And of course, with personifications of nature, as in the case of New Zealand, uh, the river itself has a legal personality in law through the legislation. Um, but what does that mean in terms of human use of the river, including Maori use? And I should point out that in the particular legislation with the Wanganui River, um, it's a joint stewardship. So it's not just the Maori. It's the government also as a joint steward. Um, so there's some interesting complexities into that. Issues as well to think of is the privileging of knowledge, elder knowledge, which I can't go into, we're not going to have time. Um, but basically there's a whole range of other kinds of knowledge that are often useful but discounted, um, including what I call elder knowledge. So there's people who lived in a while in a region or a territory or a place for a long period of time can see the changes over time and can actually provide really good knowledge as an advocate as to what's happening in that area is often discounted because they're not scientists, they're not indigenous, they're, they're not an expert, they're not park rangers or whatever. On the other hand, we have indigenous knowledge that can be privileged in some cases. For example, in New South Wales, the National Parks and Wildlife Act uh, privileges indigenous knowledge and gives them legal standing and so on. But simultaneously, we have international uh, legislation and international law that discounts that knowledge in the form of patents. So if you're indigenous people and you're growing certain plants in South America, uh, growing beans, a particular type and so on, and a transnational corporation comes along and realizes that nobody's patented the knowledge for that plant or that bean, then you're, you're, the fact that it's traditional, it's based on traditional knowledge and that you've cultivated that area in the forest and so on for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years, that gets discounted. So basically, your knowledge is trivialized through the patent process and the imposition of, of basically Western legal systems. So those are some of the issues relating to speaking on behalf of nature. Now I want to turn to the question of speaking about nature. And this is important, and this is basically the question of who has the authority um, to speak about nature. And again, I just want to raise some of the issues. This is a mapping exercise. Uh, so experts need to be heard, uh, particularly, and this part of the genesis of this talk it stems from my work on looking at um, environmental offenses in the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales. And there's two questions that, that I looked at. One was, how does the court determine the quantum and nature of environmental harm, and uh, how does the court sentence offenders once that termination has been made? Um, and it's, it's, again, fairly complicated. It's questions of epistemology, um, because what and how we know is always socially constructed. Um, questions of ontology, because we need systems of classification. Um, I look out the, the window, I might see birds. You look out the window and you might see um, particular birds. So that's about systems of classification. 
Um, and you need the systems of classification to go hand in hand with the sense of uh, species and species health as well as down to the, the population level and, and the individual level. Um, knowledge, of course, intersects with purpose. So um, if you're looking at environmental issues from a medical perspective, you might be looking at it from the point of view of health, risks, or opportunities. Uh, farmers might be looking at questions of the environment from the point of view of livelihood and so on. And of course, there's adversarial bias if we talk about expertise, particularly in a court context, um, where certain people are paid on a regular basis to be consultants, and they go into the court and give expert testimony. Sometimes they do so uh, in ways that are that are biased, not can be unconscious bias as well as um, intentional. But to give you an idea of where the complexity starts to unwind, we can talk about um, views of a river. <coughs> and I've listed here four different ways that we can look at a river. Indigenous people look at rivers uh, often through the lens of, of connection and spirituality and, and whole of life, connection and so on. A geomorphologist, can you say that, um, looks at a river in terms of the immediate boundaries and uh, through a, a particular scientific lens. An ecologist widens the boundaries, so it looks at, say, 50 meters on each side of the river is included within that analysis. So already the river's different between those two sets of scientists. Meanwhile, as I've said, the indigenous people looking at it through the lens of spirituality and connection, and then a fisher might look at the river in terms of species and, and carrying capacity or how the fish are running or whatever. The point is that we all look at the same, apparently the same phenomenon, but we, we actually classify it and look at it quite differently. And so from the point of view of expertise, if we're going to talk about environmental harm, then you really do have to start thinking through what kinds of expertise would a court, for example, want to draw upon in determining the nature of the, of the environmental harm. There are also, of course, different types of knowledge. And some of this, I, I can't go through all of this um, in, in detail, but um, we have scientific knowledge, relating to specialist expert methods and paradigms, common sense knowledge, which is mediated by experience, socialization and communications, um, and common sense knowledge, of course, is really important, because that's how many of us, uh, and many in the general public, understand particular environmental issues or environmental harms. Uh, experiential knowledge, been there, done that, seen things. Uh, so if you've walked to the top of, in my home, Mount Wellington, then you can say, well, I, it's exper experiential, and I'm a bushwalker, and I've seen stuff that you would never realize, um, right? Um, there's technical knowledge, which is related to instruments that measure things, so GPS uh, or satellite photography now is used often in courts to determine illegal land clearance. Um, so that's a technical form of, of intervention. Uh, traditional knowledge I've mentioned, uh, in this sense, um, indigenous techniques and knowledge, um, and historical knowledge, which in this, uh, again, I'll come back to elder knowledge. Um, we can talk about some of these terms in, in discussion if, if you wish, but basically the idea, the point is that there's a, a range of different types of knowledge. There are also hierarchies of knowledge. Um, so uh, whose knowledge counts, particularly in terms of legal cases involving environmental harm, is very much given through the hierarchy. There's, there's legally recognized knowledge, so patents, patents trump, oh, sorry, sorry, um, patents trump traditional knowledge. Um, there's legislative, legislatively provided provisos, such as um, heritage legislation and involving indigenous people and so on. There's court definitions of expertise, the so-called Daubert test, um, which is a, basically determines sort of um, who is a bona fide expert. Um, allowable within a court. And then there's contested, contestations of, of legitimacy um, through slaps. Do you know what a slap is? A, a, a strategic lawsuit against public participation. So it, it's an attempt to cut out your knowledge. So that's where companies would sue you, saying that you're affecting my business because you're protesting um, the cutting down of these trees. Therefore, I can't build this apartment block or, or whatever. So they sue the, the activists, uh, and they don't care about when. It's tying the activists up in court. So strategic lawsuit against public participation. 
then the counter of that is environmental civic suits. So that's where activists, um, and we've done this in Australia recently with the Adani Mining Company, with the Carmichael Mining Project in Queensland, <coughs> activists are suing Adani, saying that they're not doing the right thing. So there's a, they, they go both ways, in a sense. In a sense. Um, but, again, if we're going to talk about expertise, there's some qualifications that we have to put into this equation amongst the complexities already. And they include things like the spatial and temporal dimensions. Um, the scale of analytical lens in regards to the biotic becomes really important. So, for example, um, in my examination of the, the judgments of the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, they had to determine the nature of the damage uh, at different scales because cutting down one tree could be really significant. And we had this in Tasmania. Uh, the tallest tree in the southern hemisphere was cut down by guns, uh, a local timber company. Oops. Excuse me, that's, I mean, that's the reaction, right? And the EPA did nothing. The Environmental Protection Agency did nothing. That was really significant, but that's one tree. Um, in another context, one tree would be, you think, well, it's one tree. It really doesn't matter that much, because in the local area, there are lots of those trees. And then if you pull the lens out to a broader scale, um, it could be that even you could clear um, a grove of trees and not really have much impact from a species perspective um, and protect um, protected species and so on. Um, so you've got local to landscape and regional levels and looking at questions of ecological integrity, which is a difficult concept in its own right, but it does imply that there's a, there's a range of scales that we can oper operate at and also different types of interrelations between species, plant and animal. Um, then of course there's nature itself. Nature is not static, it's always changing. So if you can talk about expertise, um, and people are realizing more and more that the question of time and dynamics uh, requires considerable skill in the judgment because stuff that superficially may look really damaging may be in part be, be part of the natural dynamics of that environment. I've mentioned fires and fire burning. Well, eu eucalypt trees have this oil that burns, and the whole idea is that it must burn. Um, so the question of time becomes really important. Also, the question of baselines. Um, in some environments, there's uh, natural levels of arsenic that are quite high because they're naturally present in the environment. So if you're doing testing as an expert and saying, oh, there's a lot of arsenic in this water or whatever, you have to actually look at the surrounding environment and, and discover that, in fact, the baseline values may be high to start with. So from the point of view of expertise, there's a lot of stuff that has to be taken into account. And then, of course, the accumulations of harm over time, particularly when we talk about pesticides and uh, dioxins and this kind of stuff. Say dioxin and fish, they, they don't go away, they accumulate. So even if you had one spill, if you have one 10 years later, um, you, you can have an accumulation effect um, over time. The back question also takes into we have to take into account um, different types of knowledge. And this is based on work we've done in Tasmania on what I call toxic towns in Tasmania and some of the debates over toxic towns. And what we discovered there is that in some cases you have partial knowledge. Um, so we have domains of expertise in particular kinds of testing, um, but they're, they're only partial. So in St. Helens on the east coast, the northeast coast, there's concerns about water quality. And most of the concerns were raised by a local doctor. And she had a whole bunch of patients. She went through patient records and discovered that a lot of people coming to her were, had these particular kinds of illness, and they seemed to be associated with the contaminated water. Um, but it was partial insofar as it, it was only her practice where you recorded that. So it wasn't a proper epidemiological study. It was just that practice. And it could well be that people self-selected. Oh, you should go and see Alison. Alison Blaney's the local GP. She does a lot of stuff. She can tell you that if it's a problem with the water. So it could be a self-selection process. They go to Alice and bleeding the local doctor. Um, so it's a partial result. Likewise, a large part of the public discourse was not oriented around the science, and it wasn't oriented around knowledge as such. It was all about ideology. How dare you say that you can't drink water in St. Helens? You're bad for business. So she got vilified and attacked by local business people and local politicians. 
because she was trying to say, hey, we've got a problem here with the, the local drinking water. Um, and so this is what I call ideological, uh, right? So this is this distorted knowledge. It's, it's an ideological and often ad hominem, that is, an attack on the person, not on the actual knowledge or verification of the knowledge itself. So it's saying, you're bad. If you raise this, if I, if I came into Plymouth and said, you know, you're water, um, I'd probably get attacked. But uh, the, the point is that if, if I had the evidence behind me, you should be looking at the evidence, not attacking me as, as a Tasmanian intruder. Um, okay? Uh, and I suppose the, the, the part of this discussion for me is, is um, what we want to do is mobilize different types of expertise and different types of investigation. So if we want to get a sense of talking about the environment and the nature of harm to the environment, uh, then we do have to mobilize a, a, a variety of expertise and use a variety of methods. It sounds simple, but oh, you try and get governments to do it. Um, our government, for example, in response to some of the toxic pounds of claims, has tended to get the same company same consulting co company each time, which comes up with the same answer each time, right? Which is the answer the government wants. Um, so this is actually is a threat to certain vested powers and vested interests. Uh, using different sorts of expertise and different methods of investigation, we also have to take into account different understanding of nature's ontology. For example, uh, where do rivers begin and where do they end, and how do we how do we deal with those kinds of issues? Um, there's issues relating to court experts that I won't go into, but certainly um, there, there's the admissibility of different people coming into the court. Uh, when I looked at the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, they've had 30 plus years experience and really interesting looking at the cases because they know a shonky expert and, and a bona fide expert, and they just chuck the shonky ones out because they can spot them because they've been doing it for over 30 years. They also would confront bona fide experts with, with shonky evidence. So they were both getting rid of people who really weren't bona fide experts in that particular area, but they were also um, questioning evidence, even by a, a proper expert, that didn't really stack up. Um, and so that's, that's really important as well, the expertise of those who are evaluating the expertise. Um, the procedures, hot tubbing, you're probably saying, what's hot tubbing? Um, talk to me later. No. Um, hot tubbing basically refers in, the, in New South Wales, is if they, they get the experts together and they, they literally all get together, and you have to think of it metaphorically as a hot tub, and they, they work out what they agree and what they disagree with within a hot tub context, and then they issue reports to the court. Um, sometimes that can be done prior to the court proceedings, sometimes it's done as part of the court proceedings. But it's a particular methodology. It means you get the experts together to nut stuff out and save court time, or ostensibly. At the end of the day, and this is the, the, the bottom line for me, is that whether we're talking about advocacy on behalf of nature or speaking about nature in terms of expertise, then we have to talk about multiple sources of information and knowledge. Um, do I have another slide? I'm not sure. I don't know. Do you want me to look? Yeah. Oh, oh no. no. Okay. Can you go back? Uh, let's go to the heading. That's really what I wanted to end with. Oh, the beginning? No. Oh. The heading of this is approximating truth. Oh. Um, and I think that it's incumbent upon those who are concerned about the environment and who wish to talk about the rights of nature and who wish to advocate on behalf of nature or to provide expertise about nature, it's incumbent that we, we take into consideration the complexities of these issues but at the end of the day, we have to make a decision. And to me, the, the best way to make a decision is to get as close as we can to truth. So it's approximating truth. It's not saying that we necessarily have the truth, um, in part because nature is dynamic, in part because we just don't know. We still haven't identified all the species on the planet. Um, we're still identifying all the ones that we've made extinct. So. Um, the bottom line, really, speaking for and about nature, is that let's speak the truth, which in this case means um, broadening our horizons and being critical um, of all sources.
of all sorts of stuff. So thank you, and we'll open it for some questions. very much for that and <clears throat> totally agree actually but um, when it comes down to that that final point that approximating truth um, how far do you see things such as environmental principles so environmental legal principles things like the precautionary principle that would turn that truth on its head in some respects from the perspective of somebody that's trying to put forward a truth when actually we can't possibly find out that truth um, so that we have to operate on a precautionary basis um, I would say, particularly with the precautionary principle, that um, it's not very well implemented in practice. It's not operationalized at all in a lot of places. Even though on the books, a lot of places say that we operate part of our principles. We have that in the jurisdictions all across Australia uh, and nationally, that the precautionary principle is supposed to be in place. For those who don't know, the precautionary principle basically says, um, if there's uncertainty about the knowledge and the potential harm, then you don't do it. Right? So. Uh, but it's in, there are different types of precautionary principles. Um, there's a German one, and there's a US one, and so on. So there's different types. But the, from the bottom, the bottom line, from those who love nature, um, is that uh, it's not it's not put into place enough. Um, and and I would say approximating truth should get us into the question of uncertainty. And once we get into the zone of uncertainty, then I think that that should be grounds for for stopping uh, developments and all that kind of stuff. Um, because in many cases, the developments that aren't stopped are those that destroy forever. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's... it's yeah, it kind of does. In Europe, it's been relatively um, well trailed through environmental legislation, but as you said, the, the, the real difficulty with it is, is it's in its implementation. Give you one example at the moment, um, fisheries in, in the UK, they, um, for various um, types of marine protected area that are, are designations that are being um, brought up at the moment. Both sides are arguing that the precautionary principle should apply to the other side. It, it's up to you to prove that it's not going to cause any problem. Well, it's up to you to prove that it's not going to cause any problem. And so the regulator and the fishers are both in conflict about actually establishing who it is that actually has got to come up with something that approximates the truth, um, which then obviously causes inertia. Okay. That, well, that's interesting as well from the point of view of onus of proof. Because generally speaking, the onus of proof is not on the developer. It's on the, those who are against the developer. I'm using developer because... Because. Um, because often they're the ones who are, who are moving into and, and, and affecting natural environments. Um, but basically, the onus of proof from the point of view of environmental harm is often on the advocate um, against the developer rather than the developer. And one way in which developers get around uh, questions of environmental harm is through meaningless social and environmental impact assessment um, processes, um, which are very shonky in a lot of places, especially in my state, in Tasmania, um, where basically all you have to do is, is literally just get a, a very shonky environmental and social impact assessment that you can do yourself or farm out. Um, and half the time, they don't do the social impact assessment because people don't realize that that's integral to environmental assessment, um, impact assessment. Um, once they get that tick, it becomes harder for an advocate who's saying that developer, we don't want them to cut down those trees or, or to build that hotel or to go to the cable car at the top of Mount Wellington. It's hard to argue against them once they have that, that piece of paper. Because the onus of proof is on on the advocate's part. Now, there is a reverse onus when it comes to chemicals. So that's the, the something that, that provides a counterfoil to that kind of approach. It basically says, if you're introducing chemicals into the environment, then the onus of proof to demonstrate that that's not going to negatively affect the environment is by the, the chemical company, by the producer. So there's some complicated issues. very complex and mind-boggling everything that has to be taken into account to get it right. Is there, in your opinion, a city or a state or a country that's leading the charge in terms of getting it right? 
really good question. And here's my answer. Um, the New South Wales Land and Environment Court, I think, is a world leader. And they get it right. They've got 30 plus years of expertise in order to assess the expertise of the experts. They also do stuff, interesting stuff, with indigenous communities, including the one and only that I'm aware of restorative justice case in Australia involving environment, environmental destruction within the indigenous community. But, there's always a but, isn't there? Um, they've been uh, vigorously attacked by, uh, by businesses, particularly mining companies, and by pro-business governments. So they made a decision, for example, about four years ago. Uh, a mine, mining company had, had applied for an application to extend its mining operations in this, this community in New South Wales. The court did an amazing report saying it's got this kind of damage, ecological, social, economic ramifications, here's the thing on species, here's water, they did hydraulics, they did a whole bunch of stuff, hydrology, um, and so on, and they said, no, we're not going to back. They, the Chief Justice, Brian Preston, got vilified in the press like you would not believe, the Murdoch Press, not surprising, um, the Australian newspaper, named him and hit him hard as hard as they could. Um, they went through, I think, three different appeal processes. They, the court won each time, the New South Wales government at the time said, bugger this, we're going to change the law. And the thing is, once the government changes the law, the court is, can only do what the law says. So within the parameters of the law, uh, this uh, fantastic court, and they're so ecological uh, minded, and have an ecocentric, a bona fide ecocentric perspective and approach to dealing with environmental harm. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got these, these vested power interests, and they, they they just pass these laws that bypass them in that particular case. So, I mean, what I'm describing is all very useful, but it, it's inherently political. It's all about following the money, isn't it? Really? It's following the money, yeah. Um, but what we need to do, I think, collectively, in terms of protecting the environment and advocating for the rights of the environment, or at least protecting the environment, is that we have to mobilize and marshal as much expertise and get as many people on board as we can including surprising um, bedfellows. Um, for example, at the moment in, in Tasmania, uh, we have pollution from l large aquifers. Uh, we grow salmon in aquifers. Um, and the people leading the charge, it's not the traditional indi uh, uh, environmentalists and indigenous, local indigenous people, it's local fishers, recreational fishers. So you're gonna, you're gonna bugger up our uh, fishing spots. Uh, up further north of the state, the, the protests are from environmentalists, indigenous people, and the local surface. Because they're saying, hang on, you're going to put uh, one of your fishing pens right smack dab in a place where it's going to affect our, our surfing. And we've got some of the best surfing off this island, off the island of Tasmania. Um, so the importance and part of this is to say, look, uh, let's look at different kinds of knowledge, different perspectives. And, and then cobble it together in a way that we think can, can do the best thing for all concerned, particularly non-human environmental entities. Thank you. Yeah? Thank Picking up on what you're saying there, and the, the comment from <coughs> yeah, I can't see. Um, I have worries about this concept of approximating truth, or worries or concerns, and I'm coming from Foucault, I'm thinking of the politics of truth and who speaks the truth. And I'm thinking again, well, surely that's open to, I mean, in, very simplistically, a lot of political and ideological exploitation. So, I mean, who speaks the truth in this? And what is, it, it, it's a minefield. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. So, but you're kind of suggesting that we can somehow kind of muddle together and, and approximate a truth. No. Um. Yes, I am, but I'm doing it mainly in, through my lens of practice. So the, the issues I deal with are environmental offences affecting nature, where there's damage and harm to the environment. And the question is, how do we, who should be advocating in relation to those harms, and what expertise should we to take into account? And then 
uh, when I talk about toxic towns in, in Tasmania, I'm talking about uh, contaminated water as well as contaminated land. And, and the debates really come to fruition because what we need, in fact, is to broaden out the knowledge base because at the moment, um, they're not approximating truth because they're limiting and narrowing the frame of knowledge itself. So, but at an abstract theoretical level, yeah, yeah, of course, I, I share your concerns. But at a practice level and a, at a um, court level and an activist level, um, I would be arguing that we have to go for approximating truth. Um, and approximating truth is not the same as saying that there's no truth. And it's also definitely not the same as fake news. Um, yeah? Um, I, I was just thinking about the, your, you know, you're talking about methodology, and you're talking about robust methodology, and, you know, utilizing a comprehensive interdisciplinary approach to methodology essentially which I just think is, is fabulous and we should be doing. The thing that the the different thing here um, I think from my perspective is how um, we engage different voices, human voices. Um, my work's with gypsies, travellers and Roma and I was just learning stuff other before we came here about the complexities of managing different people who feel that their voice is the most legitimate, um, you know, and and how that is fluid and constantly shifting and moving, you know, um, and I think that's, you know, in the sense of what you're talking about, you know, not only is the nature itself shifting and changing um, and um, changing in response to those human actions, um, but so are the communities that you're talking to. So you have, you know, indigenous communities, you have incoming communities, you also have, as you say, those um, lost generations or the, you know, removed generations. Um, you know, likewise, you know, the managing those complex voices of just one, you know, community that I work with, you know, that, I think that, that those, that, them as a changing environment can be extremely challenging to pin down where the expertise lies, yeah. if you see what I mean. I don't it's know if I'm making a point or asking a question. Yeah. But, <laughs> no, it's hard. You know, is, is that simpler or is it continuing, you know, is it dynamic in that way? I suppose what I'm responding to is, is simplicity. Mm. Simplicity in, in at least two senses. One is simplicity on the part of governments who say, well, you, you've alleged that there's a problem of, of toxic soils or contaminated water, uh, we're going to bring in an expert and somehow solve the problem with that expert. Mm -hmm. and it's too simple because they're not bringing in the full yeah. range yeah. of expertise that's required. Uh, the simplicity also is that somehow assuming um, that indigenous people are all the same mm -hmm. and are homogenous in their world views mm -hmm. and that they all have the same connection. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like I say, it can be a romanticized notion of, of the link. Um, and and because there's political divisions, in particular around the environment within the indigenous communities. So it's, I'm trying to challenge the notion that there's, in that sense, privileged knowledge, but it's, it's too simple. And, and globally, that's so complicated as well. So I just happened to see Chris Kneen talking last week about indigenous um, people in Australia and the, 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 you know, the heterogeneous you know. Yeah communities there are and that is completely unknown you know from, from this perspective you know and I'm not, you know it's relatively unknown and but when we're talking about global policies global business global enterprise that that's where the you know the impact is really felt on the granular level yeah. locally yeah. now one of the ways that we also have to approach these issues is that they there must be an under underarching underpinning and overarching uh, principles and so for me I would probably refer to the literature on ecocentrism that deals with uh, earth jurisprudence and wild law and the notion of the rights of nature, not just the rights of nature, the protections of nature. Mm -hmm. And look at that as, as something that, that can be a, uh, a ground upon which then we can have these discussions about approximating truth, because it implies that it's approximating truth for a reason, that is to 
to defend and protect nature. Um, another thing, though, is, is the precautionary principle, and, and these kinds of other legal principles, public interest principles as well, or uh, public interest law, as well as precautionary principle, and, and saying let's make them meaningful. Um, also, to interrogate concepts like um, ecological integrity. So, again, in some legislation, they're talking about defending or protecting ecological integrity, or sustainable development, that's, that's it. Um, ecological, they're now occasionally talking about eco ecological sustainability, but it's basically allowing you to do the same old, same old, but just do it in a less destructive way. So it's interrogating all of these concepts, but at least having some basic principles that underpin the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, segueing slightly to the side, um, <coughs> questions of eco-justice always are balancing acts. So in some of my previous work, I'll talk about environmental justice dealing with humans, ecological justice dealing with ecosystems, and species justice dealing with non-human animals and plants. Um, and in any one situation, you have to make your assessments. So the classic case for me is in Canberra, we have mobs of kangaroos that are growing really, really big. And if they're not curtailed in some way, they denude the local environment and destroy everything for everybody. So they affect bird species, other ground species of, of animals and so on, uh, they, they eat all the grasses and the trees and the shoots and so on, and so everybody dies. Um, so in that case, you have to, from a species perspective, say, well, actually, we're going to have to do something with some of these kangaroos. And the debate is whether we move them or kill them, in my mind. Um, whereas purists um, would say, ah, oh, let's just let nature take its course. Um, and they all die. So anyway, this, this weighing up, is, is part of the course in, in dealing with environmental issues. Okay, any final comments or questions? Because I know it's after the time and it's at the end of the day. <laughs> and it's beer o'clock. <laughs> well, as ever, we can, we can continue the discussion down the pub, which um, you know, is often where the real work is done, as you know. But um, for the time being, uh, you can join me in thanking Rob for um, his talk. And thank you.